Well, what the uh, chaplain said is true. In our president's chapels, which happen about once every month, I'm speaking this year about the community covenant. I began by asking the question, what does God mean by a covenant? And he basically means an unbreakable promise that he will keep even at the cost of his own blood, like the, the promise he made to Abraham when he passed between those animal pieces all by himself. We've also begun to see what the community covenant means for us. A covenant is a way of loving God and loving one another. In fact, making and keeping covenant is one of the most powerful ways that we can say, I love you. This morning, I want to uh, speak specifically about one of the areas where I think our community perhaps struggles the most in keeping covenant. I went around uh, last spring and I talked to people that work closely with students, people in student development in the chaplain's office, uh, faculty members, and I asked if for this chapel series, what do you think is most important for me to address? And there was one answer that was far and away uh, the most frequent answer. They didn't focus on racism or plagiarism or hypocrisy. Uh, it wasn't related to alcohol, although the community covenant certainly says something about the use and abuse of alcohol, and that is an area where some of us fail to keep covenant. They didn't uh, focus on sex either, although if you want to know what a challenging area that is for us, uh, just read Augustine's Confessions. And you'll see that these kinds of temptations were there long before the so-called sexual revolution, long before online pornography, on, long before the Me Too movement. Uh, these were struggles common to humanity. So what was the number one issue that leaders on this campus thought I should address? They said I should talk about the way we speak because too often they saw Wheaton people using words to break community down rather than to build it up. One campus leader described tearing people down as an epidemic among students. Would you agree or was that too strong? Other leaders emphasized this wasn't just a student issue, how we speak to one another and about one another. It's an important growth area for all of us, staff, faculty, alumni. Those comments made sense to me. They matched some of my own observations about areas where we struggle and still need to be sanctified. It also matches what I sometimes hear from students, like the one who wrote this, Wheaton students need to learn how to give each other grace, to be resigned to their own imperfections, and to really listen to someone when they disagree. I think Jesus would have wanted us to be kind to each other he would not be pleased with judgmental, backbiting, inwardly proud young adults. Those words were written almost 10 years ago. I find them still relevant. When people asked me to, to speak about sins of speech, it also made sense to me for another reason, because I think the Bible regards the tongue as the most dangerous part of the body. Do you remember what it says in the book of James? This is James chapter 3. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect person able also to bridle his whole body. The tongue is a fire, a world, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast or bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but... No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. If James is right about all of that, then on a campus that admittedly is far from perfect, we should expect to experience the temptations of the tongue in all of its deadly power to divide, to deceive, and to destroy. The tongue has held these temptations almost from the beginning. If you look at the opening chapters of Genesis, uh, everything that comes out of God's mouth is good. And then Adam begins to speak, and his first words are of praise to God, of blessing for Eve. But as soon as our first parents believed the devil's first lie, 
human utterance was weaponized. The accusations and recriminations began immediately as Adam blamed Eve for his own misdeed. And we have been blaming and backbiting ever since. Let me just remind you briefly of some of the areas where words break us down instead of building us up. What about our current political discourse? That's an easy one. In this increasingly polarized society, I, I refer to the United States, although that's not the only nation it's true of, many conversations on public issues are toxic. Yes. Wheaton's own Ed Stetzer writes about this in his brand new book, Christians in the Age of Outrage, How to Bring Our Best When the World Brings Its Worst. In the last two years particularly, and I noticed this again just last night, something I'm not sure I'd ever seen before, and that is television panels where people are so angry with one another that they're just talking at the same time, and they keep talking at the same time, and you can't really understand what anyone is saying. Social media, that's another easy one, not just on political issues, but really on anything people disagree about. Doesn't matter what the platform is, you will see false statements, angry accusations, abusive responses, profane exclamations. Hover over the send button, and you have found an instant trigger finger for every angry emotion or contemptuous thought you ever have. Hateful words damage race relations as well. Think of all the racial slurs that people come up with to refer to other races. I realize it's before your time, but I always think of a remarkable sequence in the Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing, when people from different ethnic groups within the city get right up to the camera and spew out all the hateful words that people from their group used to describe people from all the other groups. It's a universal impulse. But our words don't even have to be intentionally derogatory to be hurtful. No, when our words acknowledged, unacknow uh, express unacknowledged prejudice or give voice to prideful stereotypes, the, word, the wounds cut just as deep, sometimes deeper. Here's another big one for Christian communities, and that's using our words to complain. Uh, we were reading earlier from Psalm 81. It's uh, a psalm set in the context of the Exodus. God had done everything he could to provide everything that his people needed, and yet still they had all kinds of complaints. They weren't thanking God. They were criticizing their leaders, griping about the meal plan, exaggerating how bad things were, uh, generally telling God that they deserve something a lot better than what they were getting. What about you? How often do you find yourself complaining about how busy you are, criticizing a professor, telling people how annoying your roommate is, whining about all those little things that we like to whine about? Then there are all the bad words that people use. Curse words that take God's name in vain or verbally abuse a person made in his very image. These words are neither honoring to God nor loving to one another. They may even be a form of blasphemy. That's another sin that we explicitly condemn in the community covenant. I won't argue this point now, but I mention it for your reflection. I believe that casually saying, oh my God, as some people do, without really meaning it, is a way of taking God's name in vain. And there's so many other sins of speech that I could mention. I said I would be brief. I'm not going to take time to talk about idle gossip, shallow flattery, impatient irritation, self-righteousness, self-pity. We use our words for all of these purposes. We use them to find fault with others or to give people a better impression of us than we deserve or to insist on our own way. Instead of finding words that would end an argument, we use the words that keep it going. And then all the critical comments we make about others, usually when they are not present and have no opportunity to defend themselves. And all of that explains why the community covenant condemns dishonesty, slander, gossip, obscenity, discord, dissension, 
Nothing destroys community more quickly than sins of speech. And in fact, as I was working on this talk, I realized if I'm talking about speech, I'm, it's almost like I'm talking about everything. Uh, because all of our attitudes and actions have something to do with speech. And nothing destroys a community more quickly than sins of speech. We destroy one another by the things that we say. Now, I want to help us this morning be more careful and more constructive. And I want to say just two things about our sins of speech. First, I want you to understand where all those bad words and wrong words come from. They're coming straight from the heart. My friend Paul Tripp, who's written a very good book called War of Words, likes to talk about a memorable experience from his childhood. He was at a a family gathering. One of his uncles had had too much to drink. And as the afternoon went on, uh, he began to use words that were vulgar and then sexually inappropriate, including about women who were present um, on the occasion. Some of the members of the family were, at least to some degree, shocked by what he said. It seemed at least somewhat out of character, but that's not the way Paul Tripp's mother saw it. She grabbed her boys, got them in the car, and headed for home, and she said to them, there is nothing that comes out of a drunk that wasn't there in the first place. That is profoundly biblical. In his teaching on good and bad behavior in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said that every tree is known by its fruit. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, but the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. And that only makes sense. Good things come from someone good. Bad things come from someone bad. And Jesus was referring specifically, most specifically, to the things that people say. He concluded the whole discourse by saying, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Understanding this helps us with, uh, helps us, helps keep us from being dishonest with ourselves about our true spiritual condition. We, we can't just say, oh, I, I didn't really mean to say that. Well, maybe you wish you hadn't said it, but it was what you were thinking because it reflects what you were loving. The mouth is speaking out of the overflow of the heart. It also helps us with self-diagnosis. Why am I so critical? Why are some of my words prejudicial about people from other backgrounds? Why do I end up doing so much of the talking and so little of the listening? Depending on what the issue is in your own life, it's because there is still too much self-righteousness, too much contempt, too much self-centeredness in the heart. I think understanding this connection between the heart and the mouth also helps us take responsibility for what we say. We're pretty quick to blame someone else or something else for our bad words. She makes me so angry. She makes me, we say. Or else we we blame the situation that we're in. I, you know, I really couldn't help it. But according to Jesus, what we say is not determined by what other people say or do, or by our outward circumstances, it is mainly a public display of what's going on inside of us. Just notice for one day, every word you speak that is critical, boastful, profane, judgmental, and then ask this simple question, what kind of heart are these words coming from? This brings us back to something I said last month. I'm sure I'll say it again. Keeping covenant is all about love. That's what the community covenant is about. It's what God's covenant is about. And it's, it's what the promises that we make to one another are really about. And if this, in this case, if we want to see a change in the way that we speak to one another and about one another, it's going to take a change of heart. Words are the vocalization of our affections. We're always speaking from the heart. That's what Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 6, which means that if I really don't love you or respect you or have a positive regard for you at the heart level, I will never truly love you with my words. And so I want to give you this morning hope in the gospel. That's the second main thing I want to say, because if our words come from our hearts, then there is actually hope for us. Because the Holy Spirit has the power to change the human heart. It's what the Spirit does. And then 
because of the change of the heart, also to transform the way that we speak, the way we speak to God and to one another. Now, all of that starts with repentance, with confessing our sins. So to help with that, and maybe we don't even need any help after the things that I've already said, but let's just imagine, this is the thought experiment, let's imagine for a moment that I took one day from your life, say in the past month, and I had a complete recording of everything that you said over the course of that day, and that I now had the opportunity to play it for the whole campus to hear. Uh, how nervous would you be right now about your reputation with others, your relationships with some of your friends? How much would it matter which day it was that I chose? How much would you wish that you had kept your mouth shut instead of open? Would you be willing to say uh, right now, you know what, we don't really need to do that. I'm just gonna admit right now, I'm, I'm a sinful speaker and I'm ready to confess that right now, that I, this is still an area for me where I sin and need a savior. I know for sure in my own life, there are words I wish I could take back, things I wish I could unsay. I was thinking of one time in particular, I was frustrated with one of my children. Amazingly, the child kept disagreeing with what I was saying. And um, to get my point across, I, I went farther in my comments. I said what I wanted to say harshly in a way that could only inflict a wound. Okay, just stop, the child said. And I did stop. In fact, I apologized immediately, but still those hurtful words had become part of the soundtrack of our relationship. Some of you have exchanged similar words with family members and other close relationships. Thank God, there is forgiveness for sins of speech as much as there is for any other sin. Jesus died for, for backbiters and braggarts, for liars and talebearers, for slanderers and self-aggrandizers, for every poor sinner who ever opened his, his or her mouth to say something that never should have been said. Jesus died for those sins, and when he did, our guilt was totally taken away. I love the, the story that the prophet Isaiah tells about this in Isaiah chapter six. He was a prophet, and so it was his job to speak messages from God. In fact, he had, he had gone around pronouncing a lot of God's judgment against other people. Woe to you for this sin, woe to you for that sin. Then, then he came to this moment when he was in the temple and he saw the absolute holiness of God. And in that moment, he realized that he too was a foul-mouthed sinner. Woe is me. He had to say, I'm, I am lost. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It was a moment in that vision of the living God when Isaiah came to absolute, total, personal honesty. And praise God, right at the moment when he confessed his sin, there was mercy for him because an angel took a burning coal from the altar of sacrifice and touched specifically his lips with it and said, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Isaiah's filthy mouth was made clean by the grace of God and you can be clean. You can be clean. If you will confess the sins that come out of your foul mouth, and then ask the Holy Spirit to take control. You know, when the, the apostle James talked about the fiery dangers of the human tongue, he said that that same mouth can be used for blessing. And that should be our prayer. The scripture says, this is from Proverbs 18, not only death, but also life is in the power of the tongue. And we see this in the very words of our God. We gave, we gave God an amazing prayerful invitation at the beginning of our worship this morning, speak, O Lord. And he does speak. God spoke and creation came to life. After the fall, he, he spoke again to promise life through the seed of the woman, a life that eventually came in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the word of God incarnate, the, the word that became flesh, the perfect embodiment of holy speech. 
Jesus never wasted an idle word, and he never spoke with anything except love. Even his words of rebuke had that quality to them. Jesus said, I forgive you, and people were forgiven. He said, bless you, and people were blessed. He said, come forth, and the dead came out of their, of their tired graves. And then when he ascended to heaven, Jesus sent us out into the world. He, he spoke a commission to us, sending us out into the world with words of eternal life. And this is the, this is the living Savior in whose image we are made. So let us choose our words wisely. Use them for worship. Use them for intercession. Use them for sharing good news. Use them to create instead of destroy, to heal instead of hurt, to build up rather than to tear down. Use your words to restore, to renew, to reconcile. Words have the power to do all of these things. And the, the community covenant speaks to all of this. It doesn't just tell us what not to say, although it does say some of that. It also tells us what to say and how to say it. In fact, the speech act of making covenant is one of the best ways to use our words. I noticed this when I renew covenant in the company of the board of trustees or with my senior administrative cabinet or on occasion with various groups of, of students. I, I have a sense we are speaking life into our community. And then by the grace of God, we are able to keep the promises of the covenant. And so we, we encourage one another spiritually, mainly by the things that we say. We speak truth in love. We, we become people of integrity whose words can be fully trusted. That's part of the language of our community covenant. We promise to put on kindness and compassion. We promise to, to live with peace and gentleness. Those are virtues we display by what we say and perhaps also by what we decide not to say. Sometimes silence is golden. We are about to make an admittedly funny but actually cruel comment. And we think better of it and swallow our words. We bang out an angry rant on our keyboard or perhaps on our smartphone, and then we hit delete instead of send. This too can be part of keeping covenant with one another before God. Now, of course, even the thoughts themselves may be wrong. We'll worry about thought life another time. Words are enough for us to begin to work on. When we say, I'm sorry, and I forgive you, our, our words have the power to reconcile relationships. When we, we speak well of other people, their reputation rises in the estimation of others, which helps other people see the goodness in them to recognize their gifts. It makes our community more beautiful when we speak that way. I want to close this morning just by, by showing you something that's an example of this. As a Christian leader, I, I come in sometimes for some criticism. That's part of the job. But I, I want to see you something else that I get, and that is the gift of encouragement. I don't uh, keep every thank you note that I receive or every uh, kind word of gratitude. But I, I do especially treasure uh, thoughtful cards and letters with meaningful scriptures, with, with generous words of praise. Here are just uh, some of the, the notes that I've received in recent years. Uh, <laughs> so it's a pretty good stack. It'd take me a while to go back through all of this. They come from friends and family members. They come from uh, colleagues and staff members. They come from parents. Some of them have come from you. Uh, there, there are people here this morning that have written some of these notes. I can hardly tell you the difference it makes in somebody's life to receive the gift of encouragement, thoughtful scripture, assurance of prayer. Be the kind of person that gives that kind of gracious gift. I want to pray over you the words of Paul to the Ephesians. Let's pray together. Therefore, having put away falsehood, Paul says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Lord, help that to be true of us, that we speak the truth to one another. Your word says, let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, only what is good for building up 
as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And so we pray for words that build up, words that extend grace, words that, that fit the occasion. Lord, your scripture says to put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander along with all malice. It's, it's quite a list. Help us to put it away, Lord, by the power of your spirit. And then to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.